Hello everyone. So today's lecture is going to be on service and grounding requirements, which in simplest terms is going to be how do we start to get electrical energy to buildings, both you know residential or commercial, and how do we make it safe once we get the electrical energy in that building. So let's start off with actually getting it there. So here we have a diagram of an overhead service. If you walk around neighborhoods where you see cables coming from a, uh, a, a pole or a, a power pole or, a, you know, the pole where the power lines are run on top of, and you see that cable running overhead to a house, that's called an overhead service. And the point from the high voltage transformer where they take the high voltage lines step down the voltage to what we use in houses and then that step down voltage usually 120 to 40 goes on these overhead conductors to the house and that point from the transformer to uh, there's a splice right here we'll get into that from the transformer to that splice is what's called the supply end of the service. And then from that splice or from that connection point down to basically the top half of your service box or panel, code's going to refer to it as a service box, but in a house that would be the panel. So from that connection point down to the top half of the service box is the consumer's service. So everything that comes on this cable down through the meter, which is going to count the electrical energy that's used, and then that energy from there down to what is used in this house is what this consumer is going to pay for. The other type of service that we're going to talk about would be an underground. So I'm going to draw the idea of that in red here. But same idea, we're going to go from, hopefully that shows up, we're going to go from that transformer to probably a, a meter outside here. It's not a very good meter. And then that meter is going to go to the service box. So that's sort of, I know that red doesn't show up very well, but that's the two ways that we get the service to the building, either overhead or underground. So in section zero, where your definitions are, the code book defines consumers and supply. And what you'll see is for consumers, which was from the service box up to that point of connection. All that portion of the consumer's installation from the service box or its equivalent up to and including the point at which connection is made to the supply service. So that makes sense. We have cables coming up, they get connected there. The reason this is called supply, or at least one of the reasons it's called supply is because if we look at the definition, any one set of conductors run by a supply authority from its mains to a consumer's service. So if this was an overhead service, what happens is, um, let's say for example, NMAX or Fortis, whoever the supply authority is, they run this, this overhead cable. We leave them enough wire to splice right here, but the supply authority is actually the one that runs this overhead cable most of the time. From that splice, they do that splice, and then they get a bucket truck, and they string it across here, and then they connect it to the transformer. If you're doing an underground, or in my experience, doing an underground, you're going to run that cable in a trench, or some kind of way of getting it under under the ground, under the earth, and you're going to leave enough 
at the base of that pole for the supply authority to come, put the cable up the pole, and connect it at the transformer. So, I wanted to point out those definitions in your code book. Now back to the, or still on the overhead service, I should say. We have two types of overhead service here. Both these cables coming from the house are run overhead, overhead of people that could be walking below or cars driving by, over to the pole, and then to the transformer. This picture on the left is just a service raceway. So these, this is our overhead conductors. You can see this picture's in your, in your module as well. You can see, it's not easy to see, but there is a splice right here. So from our meter, we're coming up this service raceway out of the weather head or rain head at the top. And then we leave enough cable to be spliced or enough conductors that is, enough conductor length to be spliced. And there is a code rule for how long those wires need to be left. And then the supply authority splices onto those, runs that cable across to the transformer. Now the major difference here is this service raceway does not have the force of the overhead conductors pulling on it, but the mast does because the mast is poking up above the roof, above the roof line here. And so the cables that come overhead don't have anything else to attach to. You're not gonna run them through the shingles of a roof and attach them to the, the roof joists. We attach it to the service mast. If you think of this like a sail, if the roof is the sail, like a sailboat, then the mast is coming up through the sail. The sail is, it's not attached in this situation, but hopefully you get the, the analogy. So because of that force that's being applied to the mast, there's some extra rules and precautions that code is gonna dictate that we have to follow because as you can see better in this picture, the, those overhead conductors are being attached to the conduit right here. So this, this little clevis is attached to the, the mast and the um, neutral wire, which is in the middle of this, of this type of cable, we'll talk about that more in a minute, is attached to this clevis, which is then attached to the mast. So back to that first picture, as you can see, there's nothing supporting this cable from the power pole to the mast, to the mast head. So we have force being applied to the mast down like this. And we don't want that to rip off the wall and tear apart the roof. So there's specific rules for mast clamp installation. There's gonna be more support necessary because there's nothing to support it above the wall here. Once it goes through the roof, there's no support for this, for this conduit, for the mast. And so we need extra support so that those overhead cables that are attached to it don't rip this thing off the wall. There's also limitations for uh, code is going to give us a maximum for how far above the roof line that the mast can be. It has rules for what can be used as a service mast. You can't just use um, PVC, which is a type of plastic piping for a mast because that's going to break a lot easier than rigid steel conduit. We also have mast clamps, not just straps, not just uh, strapping to keep the raceway up. Now we have mast clamps that are gonna provide more support to this conduit. 
So if we go back to a service raceway, we just have regular um, strapping all the way up to the weather head, but the overhead cable or triplex cable, which has a which has a bare neutral in the middle, and then it has two um, conductors, two live conductors. But that whole cable is now attached to the structure. It's now attached to the house because this raceway, which you can see is below the roof line, the raceway is attached to the house. The cable is attached to the house. So this cable is not applying force to this service raceway. Now these pictures in your module <clears throat> do a great job of pointing to the necessary rules for each part of a service. The service comes from the transformer and so that means from the transformer until we get it to the panel there is not protection on these cables. What I mean is there's not a fuse or overcurrent. So we have to be extra cautious or extra conscious maybe of how people can access these service cables, how people can access the um, supply to the buildings. So it has to be so far away from a window because we don't want people, if we got, you know, little Timmy reaching out the window, we don't want him to be able to grab on these cables and pull on them. If he was on the ground down here, it's going to be pretty difficult for him to access these cables because they're in um, a raceway, they're in conduit, they're protected. But close to a window, we don't want someone coming out and hanging off these or, you know, coming, leaning out the window and climbing down the raceway because these straps that support the raceway are only meant to support the raceway. They're not meant to hold extra weight. So let's look at that other way of bringing a service to a house. Now you may have seen just a transformer on a pad. Uh, I believe your module calls this a neighborhood transformer. It's just a transformer on the ground. You might see one of those big green boxes as well, um, just sitting in neighborhoods. And so what we have is similar to the transformer on the pole, but now this one is on a pad on the ground. And so each house that this transformer feeds is gonna bring its service conductors from that transformer underground and over to the house. And that's typically done with this type of cable. It doesn't have to be. There's other type of cables that um, meet the requirements of being an underground or being used for an underground service. But this is USEB 90. And so we have, uh, we might call line one, which could be our uh, red or black wire. We might note that with some tape. And then we have line two. And then this stranded wire, right? All these strands that are wrapped around these two conductors is going to end up being our neutral. You're basically going to take those strands, um, twist them together so it becomes all the strands make up one conductor. And you'll notice as well that they're, I mean, they're they're bare. It's just bare copper wires. And when you um, twist all those together and terminate it at the meter base first, that's going to act as our neutral. And that will also be a bare neutral, which if you remember from, I believe I touched on in the last lecture, um, when a bare neutral is allowed. So here we are, we're in section six. Let's just jump back to the beginning here. So section six is services and service equipment. Services and everything to do with the service is important enough to have its own section of the code book. And just to sort of extra define the scope here, 
or at least define it in my mind. 750 volts or less is what electricians work on. Everything in excess of 750 volts is what linemen work on. Now, if you're in this course, uh, I'm assuming you're an electrician, but the code book does not um, differentiate. It doesn't really care. It's dealing with installation of electrical equipment and electrical things and electrical conductors, so on and so forth. And so it does differentiate, but it doesn't say who needs to use this code book, but 750 volts or less, that's what electricians are going to deal with. So keeping in mind that bare neutral that I was just talking about, if we go to 6308, it's talking about the neutral conductor of a consumer service shall be permitted to be bare, like that USEB cable, if this conductor is made of copper and is run in a raceway. made of aluminum and is run above ground in a non-metallic or aluminum raceway, part of a busway or of a service entrance cable, or part of a neutral supported cable used in accordance with 63022, which normally we don't just want wires hanging over people's heads, but the code book is saying, well, if it's a service, if it's if it's a neutral supported cable and it meets all of these criteria, if it if it's acceptable under these rules, then yeah, you can run that type of cable overhead as an overhead service to buildings. Now back to a diagram and still still thinking about the underground service. You'll notice that this underground service is in general, quite a bit safer because you would have to dig up the earth in order to get to these conductors, right? Have you ever heard of um, that, that saying, call before you dig? That's so that you don't hit um, underground electrical wires for one, also gas lines, water mains, etc. But in general, if someone's not digging their backyard every day with a backhoe, they're not going to hit these underground conductors. So we're, we're somewhat less worried. There's less um, protection required, if you want to think of it that way, because these conductors are in the earth. They're covered by dirt. Now, of course, there's rules when you're burying this wire after you run it in a trench where you don't want rocks pressed up against it. If it's going to be in sand, it has to be a specific type of sand, and the code book's going to give you all these rules. It also has to be down below the grade level a certain amount. We're also going to need to give a little bit of extra. We're not just going to come straight across and straight up to the meter. We need a little bit of extra, almost like a, uh, it's like an extra little loop. So you're not going to just bring your wire and go right up the conduit for your service wires because if there's any expansion, if the dirt or the earth moves this wire down, that might pull it out from its connection. So code's going to say, no, you have to run it across the, un or run it underground like this, and then give us a little extra when you come up. So here we are in section 12, wiring methods. Section 12, you know, it's, as I said before, it's the biggest section. It kind of, every other section sort of is part of or dealt with by section 12 because the way we wire things is a big part of the job of an electrician. And so underground installations, which is one of the ways we install our services, is going to talk about direct buried cables or raceways shall meet the requirements of table 53. Now, table 53 here we are, table 53, has this minimum cover or minimum cover requirements for direct buried cables or insulated conductors and raceways. So if we have conductors, wires, what have you, underground, it has to be so far under the earth, under the grade level. 
and if it does not have protection, it has to be farther below the grade level or um, deeper into the earth, if you want to think of it that way. Now, if you see my book on my or table 53 in my book, I have a line across here because it gives you three wiring methods, cable not having a metal sheath or armor, which would be that USEB cable, cable having a metal sheath or armor, or raceway. But if it has a metal, metal sheath or armor, or if it's in a raceway, it's going to be the same distance under the earth. So I draw a line to say there's basically two methods of installation or two types of wiring methods. So we have uh, 750 or less. That's, that's what electricians are dealing with. That's what we're installing. If it's a higher voltage, it has to be farther below the earth. And according to this table, once it gets above 750 volts, they don't care the wiring method. It has to be either 750 millimeters or a full meter, which is what a thousand millimeters is, under the earth, under grade level. Two, and it even notes, to the top service of the conductor or cable. So it's not to the middle of it, it's to the top of the conductor cable raceway and the finished grade. So if we go back to 12012, 12012 gives us the table to start with, and then it also gives us some reductions we can do which we can reduce by 150 millimeters where mechanical protection is placed in the trench over the underground installation. And then it gives us rules for what that mechanical protection has to be. It shall consist of, it has to be flat, and it has to be wide enough to extend 50 millimeters beyond the cable or raceway. So what that means is if, get that picture back. If you use one of those approved um, protections from subrule three and you put that protection between the wire and the finished grade, that protection has to extend, if we think of this as our cable, draw a crude thing here, and this thing I'm drawing, if we think of it as our protection, then from here to here shall be 50 millimeters, and from here to here shall be 50 millimeters. Or it has to extend, it has to cover more than the cable. You can't have it just as wide as the cable. And if you do that, you shall be permitted. You're allowed to go ahead and, those are ways to read, shall be permitted, shall be permitted to be reduced by 150 millimeters. And so what that means is if you put that mechanical protection in, you can take these values from, not that one, from table 53 and you can subtract these by 150 millimeters, depending how you wired it, depending the voltage on it. So that's sort of the, uh, I just want to touch on the, the, uh, the, how far you have to bury underground cables. One more note on this table. You'll notice that 450 millimeters is the, um, as, as shallow as you can go. So if you put mechanical protection, which would reduce this by 150 millimeters, these would these numbers could be 300 millimeters with mechanical protection. So as shallow as you can go would be 300 millimeters with underground installations. That's what that means. So we're back to section six. I wanted to look at six three hundred under wiring methods of section six, and just kind of talk about, take a second to just talk about how the code 
words things and why it matters in terms of how it words things. So 6300 sub rule two has these three items, A, B, and C. And in these items, let's just read real quick. Raceways entering a building and forming part of an underground service shall be sealed and shall. Enter the building above ground where practicable. So you have to be above ground if you can. Be suitably drained or be installed in such a way that moisture and gas will not enter the building. So we have three items here. And B and C is giving you two options. You can either suitably drain the underground service or it can be installed in such a way that moisture and gas will not enter the building. So you can drain um, that, you know, the underground service, however it comes into a building, or you can seal it or make it so that things can't, you know, moisture and gas can't come into the building because once you put that service into the building, you've now created a hole and you've created a hole underground and underground has water, um, strange gases that get stuck. But that's a, that you can do this, you can do B or you can do C. But first off, A, which is enter the building above ground. So first you have to do A. First you have to go above the ground when you can. But if not, you have to do this or you have to do this. So that's about, that's about services. I wanted to point that one out, but I wanted to just kind of do a little reading the code book lesson while we're at it. Now, another sort of, this is just for code class. You may come across rules that mention, um, unless there is a deviation allowed in accordance with rule 2030. So let's jump back to, and that's our general rules section, 2030 is a rule that in the field, you may be able to get a deviation or postponement from uh, an inspector or some kind of authority. But in code class, we don't have deviations or postponements. Okay, so if you ever see that and think, yeah, but what if, no, you don't get a deviation or postponement. It's, okay, so I wanted to point that out in case anyone uh, tried asking about that. So we're, we're trucking along now, we got we got our services installed. Now we have our meter installed outside and we came into our panel. This meter is probably outside and it, well, it better be readily accessible to the supply authority. And it better be the appropriate height that the supply authority wants it to be at. Because if you had to move the height of this thing afterwards, it's going to be a real pain. If you need it, if the supply authority wants it higher, well, you probably don't have that much extra wire. If they want it lower, now you have to deal with all that extra wire. So there are Alberta variations in the stand data for the height they want the meter at. It's usually about 1500 to 1800 millimeters. The code book doesn't dictate exactly the height of the meter. It kind of allows um, who's ever using the code book or the supply authority in the area to dictate that. But just know that it has to be readily accessible and at an appropriate height that the supply authority wants it at. And you'll see this, this, this um, perforated or dotted line here. And so after the main service disconnect, now we're on the load side of the panel. So if you remember from that first image, and if not, here it is. The service is from the transformer to the service box, right? And we have one half that's a consumer's, the other half is a supply. Now where it ends is in this service box, 
which is after the breaker. If you're in our lab class, you can you can kind of look at the main breaker in case you haven't seen one before. And after the main breaker, you'll see that this top half has a different cover than the bottom half of the panel. And the bottom half is going out to all our loads in the building, wherever it is, maybe a house. This would be the inside of, let's say it's a house. And the main service disconnect, I mean, it has service in the name. It's meant to turn on everything that's connected to this panel or turn off. So supply side is where our service conductors come in and get terminated to the main breaker. And then the load side is everything after that. So we're back in section six in your code book and there's some rules or there's a rule to where you can put the service equipment such as your, you know, your meters, your, um, your breaker panel or your fuse box maybe. Um, and I hate to break it to you, but no, you can't put the panel in a coal bin. Sorry, can't be in a closet, can't be in a bathroom, and you can't put it in stairways. You can't have it in a hot room, and you can't have it in a room that doesn't have clearance less than two meters. Now, if you see in your code book, I'm assuming everyone's, this is their first time with the code book in the, the 2021 code book. If you see this delta symbol, that means between the two code books, there was a change. So this item that the delta symbol is beside, and then they have the, the delta symbol up here to say this rule has changed, and then they have the specific area it's changed. If it wasn't beside this item, they might be saying the whole rule has changed. Maybe it's a new rule. So this symbol is saying there's been a change and what they've added is an item that says you can't have your consumer's service equipment located below the flood elevation. So in 2013, Alberta had some bad floods. Most panels were in the basements and so if um, an area has determined that the flood elevation level is below ground or below grade, you know, if they're, if they're assuming that a basement will flood, you can't put your panel in the basement then. That's not a good idea. That's not very safe. And that causes a lot of extra work. So if an area says our flood elevation is here, you know, if the flood elevation is the main floor of a house or higher, I don't know why it would be, but wherever they say that flood elevation level is, you cannot put your panels in the basement anymore. You can't put your service equipment below that flood elevation. And then of course it says undesirable places. So if, if, if the code book and if your supply authority does not like where the panel is, you're going to have to move it. That's the deal. And then we have sub rule two, two, which is, um, I'm not going to read all the rules to you, but you can uh, go through the module and the module points out sort of the highlights. Once again, what's in the module is what you are ultimately tested on. So I'm just trying to supplement and better explain, you know, what the module is talking about. Anyway, notwithstanding where subject to unauthorized operation, the service disconnecting means which at the, the panel in your house, this main breaker is your service disconnecting means. You don't want um, just anyone able to turn off someone else's power. So you can put it in a, you know, a, a separate building room or enclosure. If your panel is in your house, which has locks on the outside, hopefully they work and inside your house in the laundry room or the mechanical room is where your panel is well that would not be subject to unauthorized operation assuming someone doesn't break in so that's what sub rule two is talking about now one rule that sometimes trips people up if you're not getting tripped up by it i wouldn't worry about it but 6402 
methods of installing meter loops. Talks about metering equipment. So this right here would be metering equipment. So we're going to look at 6402. And we're going to talk about cold sequence and hot sequence metering. So subrule 2, metering equipment shall be connected on the load side of the service box. The load side of the service box. Well, does that make this picture completely incorrect? Because this metering equipment, it looks to be on the supply side. This is our service box and our service conductors, maybe they're coming in, maybe they're coming in from the bottom and from the top, who knows? Or overhead or underground, I should say. Obviously, it's coming from the, the bottom. But this meter is on the supply side. How? Why? Why is that allowed? So what the codebook says is it shall be on the load side, except it shall be permitted to be connected on the supply side where, and you'll see I wrote cold sequence, and uh, I, wrote, I wrote supply side to supply side. No idea what I was doing there before, but this should say, if it's on the supply side, it's hot sequence. So load side is cold sequence. Supply side is hot sequence. And what I mean by that is this would be what we would call, not an official term, but in the, in the trade, we call it hot sequence metering. And the reason, oh, sorry, I'll actually show that on the camera. The reason it's called hot sequence is if you were to take the meter out of this meter socket, this top half, if you're, and usually it's the case that your service conductors are terminated on the top half of your meter and then the bottom half those conductors will come out to your panel. This top half, once you pull the meter out, would still be live. This top half is coming through this, this would be the service raceway, and it's going out to the transformer on the pole. And so this bottom half is dead, but this top half is alive. So that's why it's called hot sequence metering. And the reason we're allowed have it on the load side of the service box is because for your house we're going to meet these criteria as we'll see so except it shall be permitted to be connected on the supply side where no live parts or wiring are exposed so uh, not really a i mean i don't want to say duh but yeah duh we don't we don't have stuff stuff exposed unless someone starts messing with it so sure, check, no live parts or wiring are exposed. The supply is AC and the voltage does not exceed 300 volts between conductors. So at, your, at the panel at your house, you have line one and line two. Each one is 200, 120 volts, pardon me, 120 volts. So between them, we get 240. And that's as much as you can see in your house panel. And so we do not exceed 300 volts. Great, between conductors. And so it has to have, what this rule is saying is, if you're gonna put on the supply side, if you're gonna do hot sequence metering, you can't have live parts exposed. You can't have it above 300 volts. And the rating of the consumer service does not exceed 200 amps for a meter mounting device, which this probably doesn't. This is probably a 100 amp panel. Most houses don't go above 200 amps. Uh, most of them are about 100 to 125 amps. Um, your apartment might be about 60 amps. 
And then we, we can keep going. We can say, well, 300, it says 320 amps for a meter mounting device equipped with a bypass means. Sure. Or 600 amps for a transformer rated meter mounting device located outdoors. Sure. And so that's how we do hot sequence metering. Cold sequence metering, if you've ever been in a uh, commercial electrical room, cold sequence is going to be on the load side. And what that means is, let's say you have a, a transformer somewhere, and you're going to bring your service conductors into a, let's say it's a big high rise with, you know, windows forever. I'm not going to draw those windows, but your service comes in. And if it's cold sequence metering, it's going to come into a disconnect. It won't come into the meter first, like we have in our house, like we have with a hot sequence meter. And then from there, it's going to go to our meter so it can count can count all the usage and then it's going to go to our maybe our distribution panel or just one main panel for the place so what that means is if someone goes to your house and pulls the meter your house doesn't have any power and that's what happens when you basically don't pay your bill is someone is going to come and pull your meter because the supply authority is saying hey we don't give electrical energy away for free so you don't get any anymore whereas in a commercial building this room is probably let's make it a room i guess it's probably behind a locked door where only authorized people are allowed to enter so if an authorized person is going to turn off the power to the building um, they either plan to do that or <laughs> are, are going to lose their job for doing that without planning to do that. So this is what's called, this is our panel, cold sequence metering, because I can turn that disconnect off and this whole meter is dead. It's not live anymore. It's not hot. So now that we have our service brought in in whichever method we chose or whatever method worked for the application, we're going to need to add um, or set up and install and construct certain safety features or some of the safety features to make using this electrical energy uh, safe in the building. And what we're going to start to talk about is non current carrying metal parts or non current carrying conductive surfaces because what our live wires are connected to is a breaker those breakers are installed on this on this bus on the spine of the panel and so this bus our our live cir main service conductors and these conductors coming out of the breakers, we want current flowing on all those wires, all those conductors, as they go out to a load. But we don't want current on the face of this panel, on the shell. We don't want it on this conduit. We don't want it on our meter base, so on and so forth. So to make sure that doesn't happen, we're gonna to start to use bonding and grounding the uh, one of the big things for section 10 is what's bonding what's grounding and what's grounded so this white wire is the grounded system conductor this is our ground did conductor this green wire going out to our grounding electrode 
This is our grounding conductor. And this is our bonding conductor. So we can have multiple, we'll, we'll most likely have many bonding wires in a house, in an electrical installation. We're only going to have one grounded system conductor in most cases. This would be the grounded circuit conductor, also called our identified conductor, and sometimes called the neutral wire. In the field, you may have called, we grab our Lumex, In the field, you probably said, well, you know, or maybe somebody told you first day, hey, this is your hot, the black wire is the hot, this white wire is your neutral, and this is your ground. And you go, okay, got it. Ground, neutral, hot, hot, neutral, ground. But that's not the perfectly precise wording. Now, if you understand what someone's talking about in the field, that's exactly what matters in the field. But we have to make sure we know what we're talking about when we deal with the code, because the code is very specific as to what is a bonding conductor, what is a grounding conductor, and what is a grounded conductor. Now, for a real world example of why do we ground and bond? Why does it matter? Why is there an entire section of the code book dedicated to grounding and bonding? is to create what the codebook calls an equipotentiality between non-current carrying surfaces, parts, conductive things that we don't want current on, and anything that may come across it. So here is a real world example that happened to somebody at a company I used to work at. So. In a room, a mechanical room, once upon a time, there was an air handler. It's probably still there, but that doesn't really matter to us. So you may have seen the acronym AHU. That's an air handling unit. And on this air handling unit, they had the disconnect, as is sometimes the case. Sometimes the disconnect's on the wall. Nonetheless, this was the disconnect. A worker came in to the room to do his thing. He's in the mechanical room. Maybe he has a little name tag. But let's not let's not joke too much because this ended up very serious. So as the worker walked over towards this air handling unit and they touched some kind of metal on the shell of the air handling unit might have been the disconnect um, serious incidents you don't usually get the full story this worker got hit by or electrocuted by 347 volts this person was very seriously injured that's a lot of voltage to go from a non-current carrying conductive surface to a person. So if you wanted to take a voltmeter between the person and this surface, which was not supposed to have any current on it, any voltage on it, it was not supposed to be, um, that surface was not supposed to be live, that voltmeter would read 347 volts because something happened, and I was not allowed to find out what, but something happened where the method of creating an equal potential, an equipotential difference between the surface of the disconnect, the shell of the air handler, was no longer there. It was no longer bonded back to the ground. And so when this person walked in the room, they got hit, burned, probably hurt a lot. They got sent right to the hospital because 347 volts 
was the difference between them and this surface. And that's what happens when we don't properly ground and bond anything that is in contact or near or could be near electrical sources. So that's a real thing that happened to somebody. Um, I'm not sure what happened to that person afterwards. I believe they came back to work, but they were severely burned because someone did not properly ground and bond non-current carrying conductive surfaces. Because once again, we want current coming from our breaker going to, you know, maybe it's also going out to, we have a receptacle that someone wants to use. Totally. We're going to want current there. Try a little electrical. We're going to want current going out to our lights. Totally. Yeah, we do. Absolutely. But the shell of the light and the octagon box that the light is attached to, we don't want current flowing on that because when someone touches it, they will get hurt. And that's no good. Then the electrician did not do their job properly. So, back into section zero. Always a good place to start with a new section. Um, or if code is referring to a term that you don't understand. If you're looking for a definition, it's probably in section zero or at the beginning of the section. Those are the two places that code has definitions. So the bonding conductor, a conductor that connects the non-current carrying metal, sorry, non-current carrying parts of electrical equipment, raceways or enclosures to the service equipment or system grounding conductor. So that's what our that's what our bonding conductor does. Our, if we go over to G, now we're going to start to talk about what is grounded, what is grounding, and what is our grounding conductor, and which is our grounding electrode. So when something is grounded, it is connected effectively with the general mass of the earth through a grounding path of sufficiently low impedance. Now, if that's your first time seeing the word impedance, if you think about um, impediment or to impede something, uh, for example, a student not doing their work would be an impediment to them learning and then therefore passing exams, right? That would, it's going to keep you from doing that. So impedance, um, to tie it back to theory, impedance is taking into account all these other different factors, including resistance. We've been talking about resistance, ohm values, uh, in, in later periods, when you go to school, you're going to start to calculate impedance instead of resistance. But for first period, we're going to think of impedance as basically the same thing as resistance. And so when we've grounded something, the grounded um, stuff, everything that's grounded, needs to have a low impedance path. It needs to easily let the current go to the mass of the earth or the dirt, right? The top layer of the Earth's crust. We're all, I mean, probably most of us are standing or situated pretty close to the, you know, the top of the Earth's crust. So we, when it's grounded, it's connected with the general mass of the Earth. When we're talking about grounding, we need a permanent and continuous conductive path to the earth with sufficient opacity it's got to be able to carry any fault current liable to be imposed on it and once again sufficiently low impedance to limit the voltage rise above ground and to facilitate the operation of the protective devices in the circuit so as it said there permanent and continuous when we start to 
install our bonding conductors that are all tied back to this um, grounding bus or this bonding bus, we're, we're uh, making sure non-current carrying metal parts of lights, uh, receptacles, switches, the boxes they're in, um, this is this is a simple or this is a drawing of a motor. So we don't want we don't want current on the housing of the motor. We want current going to specific points in the motor. So we bring our live conductors in. We splice them onto wherever, or we terminate them onto wherever to make sure the motor runs. But we need permanent and continuous paths in case something happens. That there is a permanent continuous path back to here which will then go up to this grounding conductor come down to the grounding electrode and that current will just dissipate into the general mass of the earth the earth can take probably more current than we could ever make it's 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 probably fine to just dump all those electrons into the earth should it happen So, grounded, grounding. Now the grounding conductor is the conductor used to connect service equipment or system to the grounding electrode. You will almost always have one grounding conductor in your system. So, we bring in a service, and then we have one grounding conductor that every everything that is grounded will go back to this grounding conductor somehow and that will go to the earth should something happen and that all has to be continuous and a permanent connection so on and so forth our grounding electrode is something such as a buried metal water piping system. Sure, that might work. Or metal object or device buried in or driven into the ground in which a grounding conductor is electrically and mechanically connected. So the one grounding conductor goes to the grounding electrode and we have to make sure that's in a low impedance path to dissipate any fault current or any current we don't want in certain areas into the earth, into the general mass of the earth. So let's look at the start of section 10. It's called grounding and bonding. And you might see my high tech labeling system of pencil, which is basically to say item A under the scope. So item A is all grounding. Grounding as follows, a solidly grounded system, impedance grounded system, and ungrounded systems. We're basically going to be talking about solidly grounded systems. That's most of the systems you're going to deal with. That's um, your house is probably a solidly grounded system. An apartment complex is probably a solidly grounded system. Most commercial buildings are solidly grounded systems. So that's, those are that's what it's talking about grounding. And then we're also going to talk about bonding. We're going to talk about it as bonding as bonding and equipotential bonding. What the heck is that word? Section 10 says, I got you. I defined it down below. Now, equipotentiality is the state in which conductive parts are at a substantially equal electrical potential. We want an equivalent potential. So if we go back to this situation, that this bad situation somebody got in, <clears throat> you may have heard me say too many times in the course so far or in the other lectures that voltage is a potential difference. There is a difference of potential energy. And so what happens when things are not bonded and you have non-current carrying parts that have current flowing on them. And if we have current flowing on them, we're going to have voltage. In this situation, the air handler is fed by a 347 slash 600 volt source. That would be AC. Well, 
Yeah, probably it was AC. And so when the worker touched something that should not have current on it, obviously they're expecting to not get electrocuted by 347 volts. The lack of equipotentiality caused the electricity to go to the worker. That was its path of least resistance. It couldn't get anywhere here. It didn't have um, a, a, the system wasn't grounded. So it didn't have a path back to the earth. So it said, Hey, I'll just take this guy. And so that the, the difference between the worker and this surface was 347 volts. We want it to be, obviously that's bad. We want it to be zero, right? We want the worker to be basically zero volts. And when they touch something that shouldn't have current on it, that should also be zero volts. And so that's, that's what it's talking about when it says equipotentiality. Okay. And then the grounded conductor in an electrical system, the conductor that is intentionally grounded or on that in a second, but the grounded conductor, we, you're going to see in a, in a picture, the grounded conductor, we intentionally ground our white wires at one point. So if we go back to this diagram for a moment, <clears throat> you may hear about an ungrounded conductor, which would be our live wire. Our un right, because if this live wire were to be grounded, were to touch something that's bonded, were to touch something that's grounded, if you took your live wire and your identified conductor, which we now know is also a grounded conductor, if you touch those together, the breaker will trip. It, I mean, it, it sure as hell should trip. Otherwise, there are major problems. But most likely, it's going to trip, trip the breaker. It's going to blow the fuse, so on and so forth. If you're ungrounded, or live conductor were to touch the bonding wire, the circuit should also trip. If this cable was installed in a, uh, a device box, in a metal box that's meant to either hold splices or you're going to install a receptacle on that box or a switch, and this live wire were to touch the box, the breaker should also trip. The breaker tripping in either of those three instances is exactly what we want. If an electrician were to not turn off the breaker and work on that live wire, and the electrician were to touch the copper of that live wire, they might get electrocuted because they might not be, or probably aren't, sufficiently grounded and bonded and their uh, the resistance of their body is not enough to resist the flow of current so they're going to get shocked so that's sort of a little personal safety message don't work on live stuff so let's look at some specific parts of this grounding and bonding system these are different types of electrodes, right? These are all grounding electrodes. Um, this one in the middle, probably the most common. You've probably dug a hole and thrown a plate electrode. You know, maybe you did about, hopefully you did about 600 milli millimeters below the earth, below the earth's crust. And this flat plate gets gets buried, gets dirt thrown on top of it. And so now there's a path should something happen for current to flow because this flat plate, this um, grounding electrode has all this contact with the surface of the earth. Same idea with rod electrodes, right? So we got two of them, they're three meters apart. That's in your code book. Same with this, all, all kind of this 
except for all this detailed information, but these measurements are in your code book. You know, you need two rod electrodes. They're so far apart. This is a bit more of a commercial application, but these are usually just a, a big, uh, long piece of copper, and you just hammer them into the earth. You connect your grounding conductor to them. You join them together with this piece of wire, and there's code rules for how you shall connect your grounding conductor to your grounding electrode. And then we have this, this pretty, pretty fancy, pretty cool thing. Um, this is a chemically charged rod electrode, so it grows these little electrolytic roots. And so this is probably more of a an industrial application or some kind of application where you need some serious grounding electrode capabilities. Or we can also use what the code book refers to as an in situ grounding electrode. In situ. Um, which in, in the layman's term basically means I'm using something that's not a manufactured grounding electrode. I'm using something that the code book still allows, but isn't something made to be a grounding electrode, but all the same, it will work for our applications. So this of course is our grounding conductor. And this picture has a very specific point at which we're going to connect the grounding conductor. Because we don't know what this shutoff valve is made of. We don't know if this is electrically continuous. It's not really meant to be. It's meant to allow water through or not allow water through. We are going to bond metal water pipes that are in the house. More on that later, That's that would fall under equipotential bonding. But if we're gonna use this as an in situ grounding electrode, we have to go on what's called the street side of the shutoff valve. This is the street side. This is where it comes in from the street, obviously. From the street or wherever it comes from, we're going to say the street because it's called the street side. So that comes in from the street into the building, into the house. It's going to hit this shutoff valve. It's going to go up to the water meter. And then we're going to start to call this the house side of this water line. So it's going to call it the street side is where we have to put our grounding conductor. Should we use this type of in situ grounding conductor? So, um, recently the code book, the uh, lovely people at the CSA, updated section 10 to make it more uh, user friendly, per se. I mean, the only people that should be using the code book are trained professionals, but even trained professionals struggle with the code book sometimes. So, they updated section 10, and one thing they put in that I would love to show you all. They have pictures in, uh, sorry, this is an Appendix B. Appendix B under Section 10. They have pictures such as, uh, we have two DC sources, and so that's now the common conductor. You might still call it the neutral in the field, but according to code, that's the common conductor. And then we have all these pictures down here about common, solidly grounded configurations. And you'll see I've labeled, that's going to be the white wire, that's going to be the white wire, so on, so forth. And it's actually a gray wire in the picture. That's probably supposed to be a red wire, but all the same. It does look like a different color, but it has this picture, which could be nice, hopefully helps explain it to you. And then probably the most beautiful pictures, my favorite, it has this picture of a consumer's service, but it's grounded at the meter mounting device. 
So, as I said, there's only one grounding conductor in a system, and you can ground or put that grounding conductor. You can terminate it at either your meter mounting device, such as it is in this picture, at which point you're going to take your white wire to the neutral bus, and since that white wire is the grounded system conductor, intentionally grounded at one point, you're going to have it connected at this one point, intentionally grounded, because our grounding conductor is coming up to the, this neutral bus, this neutral bar right here. And then we're going to run all our, you know, we're going to have a bonding conductor go from the meter into the house panel so that everything else can be bonded to it and so that it has a permanent continuous low impedance path so on and so forth all the way back and then we go up here and we go through this grounding conductor and then we're hitting the earth which our grounding electrode is connected to there's another picture equally as beautiful perhaps a more common way of uh, installing grounding conductors or grounding electrodes which is, sorry, keep moving that on you. Consumer service grounded at the service box. And this is on page, <coughs> excuse me, page 566. So the difference between the last picture and this picture is now our neutral bus is isolated from this box. So it says right there, isolated neutral bus. We still have our bonding bus. We still have to bond this meter mounting device, our meter base. And so we do that. There's a bonding bus and we run a bonding wire over to this bonding bus. And then this bonding bus is connected here, as we see, which has the grounding conductor coming down to the grounding electrode. But now we're in the panel. And so our neutral bus is still connected only at one point, but now it's connected to the grounding conductor. It's connected to the grounding electrode as well through the grounding conductor in our panel, in our service box. So I wanted to point out those in Appendix B. They're very good pictures that have uh, great descriptions, great descriptions. Now there is a very specific um, bonding conductor called the service raceway bond and the reason this one is so specific versus just our service equipment bond is the service wires that come in do not have protection they come into these lugs and they are live they're hot all the way back to the transformer so if something were to happen where the service conductors get a little nick in the insulation and they touched this raceway, we have to make sure any current that starts to flow on this raceway, these are little current arrows like it's in theory, we need to make sure that current has somewhere to go so that if someone's walking by they do not get electrocuted from the service raceway because that's a lot of electrical energy that could potentially be on there. So we have a service raceway bond. It gets connected to this um, grounding bus, which is then, you know, then we have a continuous permanent low impedance path through our grounding conductor back to whatever we're using as a grounding electrode. Now to size that service raceway bonding conductor, as well as pretty much all bonding conductors, we have table 16, which rule 10616 will direct us to. But I wanted to point this one out because it has these two categories up top that can get confusing in their wording. So. We have our wire sizes. These are all copper sizes. These are all aluminum sizes. 
right? And our minimum size copper, if you remember from section four, is a 14 gauge. Our minimum size aluminum that we can use is a 12 gauge. It's got the sizes of those wires, sure. Or sorry, it's got the size of um, a bus, if you're using a bus for bonding. And then we have this category, which is not exceeding these ampacities. We know that these values are all ampacity because these two categories above say ampere rating or allowable ampacity of. So that means these are all ampacities. So not exceeding 20 amps, you can use a 14 gauge copper conductor, a copper wire. So in this is these are all 14 gauge in this cable. But that means if you had 12 gauge wire terminated under a 20 amp breaker, you could still use 14 gauge as your bonding wire. And we often do when you get that 12 to cable to run up to perhaps kitchen receptacles or anything that needs to be on a 20 amp breaker. That cable comes assembled most of the time with a 14 gauge bond because that's all it needs to be. When we get up to 30 amps, it needs to be a 12 gauge bond. Okay. But this cable, this 14 gauge Lumex, the live wire is going to go to an overcurrent device. An overcurrent device is simply either a breaker or a fuse. Something that if there, if it goes above the current, you know, if there's a fault current or, you know, when we trip the breaker, that breaker has gone over its current that it allows. And we'll get into sizing overcurrents in another module. So I say all that because there's two categories, as I mentioned, one is for the ampere rating or setting of overcurrent device protecting conductors, equipment, etc. This other category is the allowable ampacity of, of the largest ungrounded conductor or group of conductors. You'll see at the top here, I say all bonds except volt drop and service raceway bonding conductor. Because your service raceway bonding conductor does not have an overcurrent device as far as we are concerned. So you're going to size that service raceway bonding conductor. This wire right here, it gets sized based on the largest ungrounded conductor because it is going to have to take the full um, current of whichever one of these is largest because whichever one's largest is going to be able to carry the most current. So if something should happen to it and inside of the raceway, that largest ungrounded conductor starts spitting out its um, current onto this raceway, we need this raceway bond to be able to take all of that current and send it into the earth. So when we're using table 16 to size our service raceway bonding conductor, we're going to use the allowable ampacity of the largest ungrounded conductor. So just to drive that point home, if for a service we sized a one aught good for 90 degrees Celsius at a, you know, at 90 degrees Celsius, it's good for 170 amps. That's what we size our service raceway bonding conductor to. So we've sized it. It's a one aught good for 170 amps. So we go back to table 16. We think, what does my service raceway bonding conductor need to be? Well, it's not exceeding 170 would exceed 100 amps. It doesn't exceed 200 amps. So I can use a number six copper for that service raceway bonding conductor. Now let's just explore section 10 a little bit. It starts off with grounding and we're getting, 
We're getting real general about grounding, and it's going to start to talk about grounding electrodes. Grounding electrodes shall consist of manufactured grounding electrodes. So basically, there's uh, this is part one of the Canadian Electrical Code, and part one is more on the installation. Part two is manufacturing. So whoever is creating these manu <coughs> excuse me, manufactured grounding electrodes, they have specific rules. But we're the electricians. We don't care about those rules. We pick up a manufactured grounding electrode. It's got a CSA stamp on it. Cool. That's what I need for my installation. The codebook also allows field assembled grounding electrodes. And basically what that means is you can use bare copper wire or a grounding grid and you can assemble that in the field. And if that meets the criteria of a grounding electrode, sure, you can use that. And then we have this in situ grounding electrodes forming part of existing infrastructure. Your existing infrastructure would be the foundation of the house or a wall casing. So that, um, that water line from the diagram I used for, you know, it's right in your module for in situ grounding electrodes. That's part of the existing infrastructure that was there when you got there. And that's going to work as an in situ grounding electrode should you decide to use that. And then we go into, you know, the manufactured ground electrode shell in case of a rod grounding electrode consists of the two and that that diagram had them spaced not less than three meters apart. You can't have them too close. We have a plate electrode um, that has to be 600 millimeters below finished grade. And if I can go back to that diagram and mention something that I came across in my time. There is, uh, I believe it's in the stand data. It shouldn't really have to be, but some people, when they're um, putting in this, this plate electrode and they're putting the panel in the basement, so the grade, the finished grade was here outside the house. And let's say, for example, from here to the bottom of the basement was 500 millimeters. So they went, cool, I only have to go 100 millimeters more. And then I can put my plate electrode there. And so in the stand data, they basically said, uh, no, you have to go 600 millimeters below the finished grade. This is now your finished grade if you're putting that plate electrode under the, the uh, basement. You can't just kick 100 millimeters of dirt and drop a plate electrode and just squirrely run your grounding conductor over. You have This is now your finished grade. So I just wanted to clarify that in case anyone is putting plate electrodes um, under the, the basement floor. You have to go 600 millimeters um, below your finished grade. Okay. So now we're on to our, our grounding electrodes stuff, and now we're on to grounding conductors. Um, most of the time, I, I shouldn't say always because I don't want to lead you astray, but almost always, your grounding conductor. Is it going to be a number six copper or number four aluminum? But our default is our default is copper. So if it doesn't specify, if I have an aluminum grounding conductor and it just says, "What's the size of my grounding conductor?" Pardon me. <clears throat> Almost always, it's going to be a number six copper. You can have it smaller, as it says in sub rule two here, provided it's not smaller than the current carrying conductors of the system being grounded. But it's pretty rare that your <clears throat> your service or your system, your ungrounded system conductors, it's pretty rare that those will be smaller than a number six. So number six copper is usually what we use. And then we have um, 
grounding conductor connection to grounding electrodes. You're going to have to connect that properly. You can't just kind of, you know, zip tie them together. Yeah, yeah, good enough. No. You have to have a bolted clamp, copper welding by a fusion welding process, brazing maybe. If you're able to do that, you can use that. Um, silver solder, other equally substantial means. And where practical, practicable, sorry, sorry code book, it's supposed to be practicable, I guess. The connection to a grounding electrode shall be accessible. Now, when you're putting a plate electrode <clears throat> 600 millimeters below the earth, well, you know, that's not really practicable to be able to get access to that. So that's why it adds that practicable because it's allowing for the, well, you know, you're not going to want to dig up every plate electrode you bury for a house. Now, 10206 is going to start to bring up, <clears throat> excuse me, this term, extra low voltage extra low voltage. Well, what exactly does that mean? And as usual, section, section zero is our friend. Now it's not under extra low voltage, it's actually under uh, the definition for voltage, and then it's going to break it down just like this. Now, high voltage is essentially power lines people, <clears throat> because that's exceeding 1000 volts. Low voltage is the most yeah, pr pretty common. Extra low voltage is definitely common as well. But extra low voltage would be, you know, if you're dealing with a 24 volt AC control circuit or 24 volt DC control circuit, that's an extra low voltage control circuit. Low voltage, most of the stuff in your house <clears throat> would fit under low voltage. Most of it's about 120 volt AC. So that's how the code book breaks down the different terms of voltage. And then we have 10208. And you'll see lots of writing <clears throat> beside this on mine. And you'll see I say, make sure you cross-reference 4004. Then what I'm telling myself there is, hey, check to see if it fits under the identified or the identified neutral conductor. And so... 10208 is telling us which conductor of an AC system is to be grounded. And so your house is a <clears throat> 120, 240 volt three wire. And the code book's describing it as the mid phase conductor of a single phase three wire system, the identified neutral conductor, is the one that shall be grounded at one point. How do I know that? Well, <clears throat> 10 to 10 tells us that the grounded conductor, which we know, we know what the grounded conductor is because it says conductor of an AC system to be grounded, which for your house is the identified neutral. It shall be, um, so the grounded conductor of a solidly grounded system which would be your house, supplied by the supply authority. Sure, yeah, they're giving us the power. Shall be connected to a grounding conductor at one point only at the consumer's service. And so the meter and the panel are both parts of the service. So at either your meter or your panel, only once though, your grounded conductor shall be connected to the grounding conductor. And we do that with either that system bonding jumper I pointed to in table 16, or sometimes we have a brass screw that goes through the bus and it touches the back of the panel housing. So those are the two ways we call that um, equipment bonding terminal sometimes it's a it's like a strap as well but either way we're only going to we're going to do either or and then it says up to item d it says have no other connection to the non-current carrying conductive parts of electrical equipment on the supply side or the load side of the grounding connection 
So if you look back in those diagrams on, uh, I think it's page 564, 566, <clears throat> Appendix B, you'll see it says the neutral bus is isolated because there's no other connection. There's only one connection between your grounded conductor and the grounding conductor. <clears throat> so I skipped over 10300 and 10400. 10500, now we're into bonding. And straight away, it's, it's going to lay it out. There shall be no objectionable passage of current over a bonding conductor. If there's current on that bonding conductor, get it out of here. Get it into the dirt. Get that, you know, use that low impedance permanently connected path. Get it onto the grounding conductor. Get it onto the grounding electrode. Get it the heck off the bonding wire. That's why we bond things, so they don't have current on them. And we have to make sure those surfaces are clean. If you have a painter coming in, spraying paint instead of rolling it, and he just sprays all your electrical boxes, well, it's, you know, son of a bitch, now I have to get all that paint off there, because those boxes, those, the metal boxes, um, they're, you know, that, that shell, the octagon, or the the 4x4 or whatever the metal box is that you're using has to be bonded. That box is a non-current carrying metal box. It's not supposed to have current on the box. So we have to get that paint off there to make sure it's a clean surface for bonding. And on our electrical equipment, we don't want, is we don't want current where we don't want current. I know it sounds like I'm just repeating myself, but right here, 10600 is laying out that, except as permitted by subrule 2, non current carrying conductive parts of electrical equipment shall be connected to a bonding conductor. And it's giving us that exception for non current carrying conductive parts of extra low voltage. So it's saying that that is not enough of a hazard that you have to bond it. You still can. You can always exceed code, but at a minimum, you don't have to bond the non-current carrying conductive parts of extra low voltage electrical equipment. And then we're talking about bonding continuity for service equipment, you know, and we, we kind of touched on that with the service raceway bonding conductor. And these are some of the methods that, you know, the bonding continuity for these types of service, um, these ways of bringing in your service, either with a raceway, you know, if you have a cable with armor, you have to assure that there is bonding continuity through these methods. And then we're getting outside of our service equipment. Now we got bonding continuity other than service equipment. Um, if you've ever installed conduit, you may notice that unlike these cables we use in housing, you might not be using a bonding conductor for your conduit. And that's because you have standard box connectors made up tight. The metal of the conduit, that is, it's connected, it's meant to be made up tight. And that metal is connected to your panel and the panel's housing is bonded. And so that metal conduit that goes out to you know, device boxes and junction boxes, so on and so forth. That's all counting as a bonding path if it's made up tight. So if you have a couple screws missing from your EMT and you go, ah, who cares? You know, I don't want to get a ladder to get up there to just to put one screw in. That means your EMT is no longer made up tight, which means your EMT is no longer a bonding path, according to code. So if you see an inspector go, hey, you're missing a screw there, that has to be put in, or you have to pull in a bonding conductor. That's why, because it has to be made up tight if you're gonna use that as your bonding continuity. Remember, it has to be a permanent, continuous, low impedance path, so on and so forth. So, if you've ever been called on that by an inspector, when they're walking by looking at loose screws, that's why. And then we have all these bonding means for fixed equipment. Um, 
A bonding conductor that's run with circuit conductors as part of a cable is one way to do that. So your receptacles are sort of a fixed equipment, right? They're screwed onto a box. They're meant to stay there. And so we have this bonding conductor that's, that's run with these cables as part of the cable assembly, right? When we put these three conductors under this cable jacket, this is now a cable assembly. You can run it uh, installed in the raceway. Sure, that works. So those are all our those are some of the means of bonding, and then you can splice or tap the bonding conductor. Sure, yeah, as long as it's a permanent low impedance path back to that grounding conductor. Ten six one four is saying that solder shall not be used, so you can't solder your bonding wires together. And subrule 5 is telling us that a bonding conductor connection to the bonding terminal of a device shall be installed such that disconnection or removal of the device will not interfere with or interrupt the continuity of the bonding conductor. So when you wire up your receptacles or switches or lights, the bonding conductor goes under the, or at least it, it sure, as, sure as heck should, go under that screw that is meant for the bonding conductor on the device box. And then from the screw, it goes to your device. So if you take that receptacle away and you still have an ungrounded conductor, the box that the, you just took the receptacle off of or the switch or light or what have you, that metal box is still bonded. Unless of course you take the bonding wire off the screw, but you don't need to do that. And that's because subrule five is saying that, no, that box is still bonded. You're good, even though you took the receptacle off. 10.616 is giving you um, rules that I already talked about with table 16. So I won't go over that in too much detail. But let's talk about equipotential bonding. Okay, and this is the last part of section 10. So, all the other bonding we've been talking about is bonding for electrical equipment. We need to bond non-current carrying parts that are, um, you know, attached to or a part of electrical equipment because it's very possible that if it's a part of electrical equipment, it will come into contact with electricity. It might have current on it. That's the most likely place for current to be other than where we want it. And so we bond all of those non-current carrying parts of electrical equipment. But the code has other places where we might have non-electrical equipment, and we need to make sure there is an equal potential, or basically zero volts, essentially. We need to have equipotential bonding on these non-electrical non equipment, such as because if it's non-electrical equipment, it's pretty much all non-current carrying conductive parts, right? If it's a conductive part that's non-electrical equipment, we probably don't want current on it. And two really important ones are the uh, metal water piping systems of a building supplied with electrical power. Because if that's not bonded and we allow current to flow on the metal water pipes, that means there's current on the water, which is conductive, and the metal water pipes are conductive. So that's very dangerous. So code is saying, no, 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 make sure that's bonded. Also the metal waste water piping, right? Same idea. Metal gas piping, and notice it all says continuous, but because it's if it's continuous and there's current on these conductive pipes, then that means that con current can flow throughout the whole piping system. So if it's a continuous metal piping system, you shall bond it. You shall create equipotential bonding. Um, gas piping systems, obviously, we don't want any sparks near gas piping systems, near gas, near, you know, flammable things. And so if you have current, if current is allowed to flow on a metal gas piping system, 
there's a real chance that a spark might happen. So we're going to use equipotential bonding to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, if you ever worked with subfloors, pretty common in server rooms, um, you know, a raised subfloor of conductive material. So if they build a subfloor out of metal stuff and there's electrical wiring under that raised floor, then there's a chance for that wiring to put current on the floor. We don't want to have people walking on top of electrified floors. Unless it's like, you know, some kind of weird security system. It's a mission impossible thing. I don't know. And then we have this sort of oddball one, the conductive metal parts of structures that livestock access. So we're going to jump to Appendix B for that one because it's going to point out the reasoning and the logic behind why the conductive metal parts of structures that livestock access is so important. So in Appendix B under 10, was that 10, 700, the codebook mentions that livestock are particularly, particularly sensitive to the effects of step and touch voltages. Now, if you've ever worked, you know, if you grew up on a farm or you've ever worked on any kind of agricultural area, you probably already know that um, electric fencing works really well to keep livestock in because once they get shocked, they usually don't go back to that fence, right? So it keeps, it keeps the livestock in the areas where we want them. But if you have, for example, a, a metal uh, feed trough or a metal water trough or some kind of metal thing that you want them to go to, you want them to eat and drink water, and they get shocked by that, they're not going to go back. So that becomes a real problem. We want, you know, you want that livestock al alive. And so you want them drinking water. And so you don't want them getting shocked. So that's why the Appendix B is pointing out that they're particularly sensitive to step and touch voltages. And so we have to do equipotential bonding to make sure the conductive metal parts don't shock the livestock. Um, a strange, or might seem strange, that 10702 is talking about where installed in structural members, conductors for equipotential bonding should be installed in the same manner as non-metallic sheathed cable, except that they do not require bushed holes where run through metal studs. So let's think about this for a second. If you were to run this non-metallic sheathed cable through a metal stud, there is certainly a chance that that, you know, if you've ever dealt with those metal studs, they're quite thin metal. It's very easy to cut, let's see, easy to cut yourselves or the jacket of this non-metallic sheathed cable. If you're running BX through metal studs, well, that metal's not going to cut through the metal armor of BX, but if it's non-metallic sheathed cable or Lumex, same thing, you have to use, you know, these plastic bushings or some kind of bushing to make sure the metal stud doesn't cut the Lumex. But you don't have to do that for equipotential bonding. Why? Because if the metal stud cuts into the insulation of that bonding conductor, well, now that metal stud is bonded. Great. We want non-current carrying conductive parts, such as a metal stud. There's not supposed to be current on that metal stud. We want stuff bonded. So, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's exactly the intent of this, but to me, sweet. The more things bonded, the better. That's no problem. You don't have to bush those holes. Sweet. Um, material, same as grounding conductors and bonding, or for bonding means. So if it's good for grounding and bonding, it's good for equipotential bonding. And then as far as conductor size, pretty much similar to our grounding conductor. But now this is an equipotential bonding conductor. Uh, number six, copper. Unless... Um, you know, if it's unless if it's you know mechanically protected, then you can you can go down to a number ten copper. So 
that services and grounding and bonding. And that's it.